Good evening, everybody. I'm Nigel Hicks, a photographer, a professional photographer based in the southwest. I'm going to talk this evening about springtime photography since it's now sort of late March. So we're really getting into spring now, despite the, the weather we're having at the moment outside. And um, really looking at what sort of things you might want to point your camera at during the springtime. And obviously, that's going to be very much the natural world, really, as, as, as nature starts to wake up from the, its winter slumber. So we're going to be really looking very much at the natural world, and that's really going to be reflected in the, in the photography I'm going to show you over the coming 45 minutes or so. And um, there will be a, a lot of um, what plants and animal wildlife, and then also looking at um, the changing angle of the sun, and then also a little bit of, of the human world as well. But it's going to be mostly about the natural world. And just really kicking off with this picture, which actually was taken in February, so still still winter really, but really the very first sort of signs of uh, of of spring creeping in there with a really really nice calm morning, and the mist drifting across the river estuary here. This is uh, taken about a mile from my home on the estuary of the Teen in South Devon, so just a really calm morning. And uh, I just recently bought the drone, so I just sent the drone up, went up to the top of the hill and, and put. Put the drone up and got this view. So this is one of my first shots taken with uh, a drone. So <laughs> I haven't actually used it much since then because it's been too windy. One of the first things I learned with drone photography is not shoot, not to shoot in in uh, in high wind. It doesn't really work terribly well. So I've been sort of waiting for some calm weather. Anyway, so um, this is sort of kicking off with spring and then moving on really straight away into the kinds of photography that you might do in springtime, starting off with some of the earliest flowers. Uh, these are wood anemones, which um, are a really pretty little flower, which don't get much exposure, don't get much publicity. So I thought I would uh, put them in there and, and flag them up for you. They're in flower from about now onwards. And uh, they're just, as I say, this pretty little flower. They're quite difficult to photograph because, as you can see in this shot, they're quite spread, they're sort of relatively spread out. Um, don't um, form tight bunches, so it's quite hard to make them look spectacular or crowded or anything like that. But they're quite um, quite attractive. But one problem they do have with photography is that they're really beautiful white petals. Means that in sunlight they completely burn out, especially when you put against the, the, the relatively dark green leaves. So much best to photograph in sort of uh, soft flat light. Um, as taken here, uh, it's as in a wood in, 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 on the edge of Dartmoor, this one. So taken in, uh, I think it was actually taken in early April, this shot, but it's not, it usually in flower from about now onwards through till mid or late April. And just a uh, shot here, not with macro equipment, but with, I think, a 24 to 105 mil lens set at about 105 and coming in reasonably close, but far enough out so that I can get at least a cluster of, of, of these flowers. Rather more crowded, rather getting in rather more crowded uh, are the, these uh, uh, crocuses, wild crocuses, have just sort of set themselves up on uh, one of my lawns at, at home and just ca came out in, fe in February. So these are really well past their, their peak now. In fact, I think they've more or less got, gone altogether, really. But I think they've probably saw crocuses in, 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 a, in a few places. But these really are also one of the earliest flowers of spring. And there's such a beautiful flower to, to photograph, very, um, very delicate, beautiful colours. Again, best photographed in soft, flattish light. You can photograph them in, in sunlight, especially if you photograph them um, backlit, so the, with the sun shining through the petals, and that really lights them up quite nicely. But this one you can see is photographed in, in soft, flat lights, and uh, just really focusing primarily on this one flower here that's leaning over, having the others going off fairly sort of uh, more out of focus as you move away from that flower. So, you, so attention is concentrated on that one flower that's in the middle there. And shot this with a fairly wide open aperture, it's f7.1 here, see it says here. So this is taken uh, with it lens aperture reasonably wide open, so you actually get quite a small depth of field which uh, obviously helps to actually concentrate attention on that one flower in the, in the middle and mean that the others sort of start to fall away, get a little bit more blurred as they're, as they're further off. And then uh, moving into the, the king of, uh, of uh, spring flowers, the daffodil. Always struggle with daffodils and they always look so wonderful, but I'm never very happy with the pictures I take. It's, they're, they're a big flower, so easy to photograph, 
but I don't find them easy to produce really great photographs of, of them. It's a it's very strong, showy color. Um, and it's this really deep, big three-dimensional shape. It's quite, I find it quite hard to get sh shots that for me work. So I've got several, a couple of shots here I've, I've put together, different angles of, of, um, of daffodils. And this one is kind of the one that you might sort of be tempted to take in terms of coming in really close, just coming in right in close on the front of the daffodil. And of course, when you're coming in this close, your depth of field becomes a real problem. We've got this area around here, nicely sharp, and the calyx is nicely sharp, but really everything else is getting blurred. The patterns behind are getting blurred, and inside the the, the, um, the funnel of, of the flowers are also getting quite blurred. One could, could of course, take several shots with differential focusing and then stack them in the computer. Uh, then you require the flower to stay absolutely dead still throughout the sequence of shots. And I'm never quite sure about the quality of the resulting images. It's always a little bit, a little bit tricky. Um, again, the lighting, I've, I have shot this in, in sunlight. Maybe it'd be better photographed in, in soft, flat light. You would really need absolutely windless conditions to be able to shoot this image because you really need a very narrow lens after to get the big depth of field. So you're going to end up with quite a slow shutter speed. But alternative angles, of course, this perhaps is the more typical sort of shot of a daffodil photographing more or less from the side, just showing up to the whole flower, but not much of the actual plant itself. Again, shot in sunlight, um, but really manage, it, it's, the exposure is managing the light quite well. And I've underexposed the picture a little bit so that the background has gone really dark, almost completely black actually. So, so that really helps to get rid of any background clutter. And so the attention is, fo is focused completely on the flower. There's nothing behind the flower that is uh, Sort of distracting you and drawing you away, possibly a little bit more, a little bit here of another daffodil flower in the background, but that's it's really way off to one edge, not really causing any trouble in the main area of the picture. Again, using quite a, well, a moderate lens aperture, actually, f upon 10, so not a huge, uh, not was well, not hugely, not a, not a huge depth of field, not a really narrow depth. Uh, so, um, lens aperture. So what we can see here, that all this is, is perfectly sharp. Most of the petals here are sharp, but then it's all starting to go a little bit blurred in off, to, off the background here, which is, you know, that's okay. I don't have to have the whole thing sharp. I just want to have attention focus on this area and the petals as well. So that your attention is drawn into the main part of the flower and then you don't want to go any, your attention is not taken on beyond the flower. You just really home in on this flower. Interestingly, it's, it's, it might be a little bit of a cheat here. The, back, the, the black background is actually, it wasn't much vegetation there because my dog, who was completely black, was standing there and he was actually forming a very convenient black background for me. And underexposing the picture a little bit enabled me, his, her, her fur to be completely black and just completely detailless. So moving on, third and final shot of the daffodil. Um, very different kind of shot, really more or less a wide angle almost. Uh, just coming in closer to the whole plant, showing the whole plant and showing the environment it's living in. And also taken in pretty soft, flat light. But it, despite that, even though the light is quite soft and flat, you see at the top here, the petals are in danger of burning out, not actually going completely burning out. So even though the light is flat, there is quite a lot of, quite a bit of highlight on, on the flower. Now this is, um, as you can see, it's a, it's a wild daffodil, and, and I don't mean that in the sense of it simply is growing in the wild. It is actually a, a, the um, the true antecedent of all the garden varieties you see. Most daffodils you see growing out in the wild in the countryside are actually garden escapees, but there is still the uh, the, the original wild daffodil in a few, in a few places, and this is one of those. Um, wild daffodils. You, you can often, you can generally tell a wild daffodil. In this picture, it looks like just any other daffodil. But when you see it actually in the flesh, so to speak, you can tell it's not a garden variety because it's much smaller, and much simpler, and much less sort of showy than the, uh, than the than the garden varieties. And uh, um, Dartmoor, certain certain parts of Dartmoor are really good places for uh, for the genuine, true wild daffodil. And this is where this is taken along the banks of the River Teen on the edge of Dartmoor. And then there's a, I know there's a few other sites, I've heard of a couple of sites in Gloucestershire where you have true wild daffodils as well. But anyway, all daffodils, wild or otherwise, are just perfect subjects for spring photography. Experiment with different kinds of lighting, whether it be flat lighting or sun lighting. 
Uh, flat lighting is, is, despite what I've just shown you, flat lighting is a little easier. It's not necessarily as dramatic as, as a sunlit, um, uh, sunlit um, kind of shot, but it is easier to manage the, the photograph because you don't, get, you don't have so much danger of burnout. Anyway, we'll move on to a different kind of flower and cow, uh, cow slips, always a beautiful flower. You, you don't, well, you see them very much on uh, limestone grasses, so areas of where you've got limestone rock. So this one was photographed uh, in the Mendips in Somerset, which is a, all limestone, that, that area. So you see them in fields that haven't been uh, ploughed or improved in any way for some time. They have these wonderful stands of, of cow slips. This one was taken in May, so I think really from April through uh, April through to May, you see them on the, in the countryside in, in limestone areas. Um, one of the things to note about this kind of flower photography, and you saw it with the previous daffodil shots as well, and the crocus pictures as well, coming down really low to be at the flower's level. A lot of people I see photographing plants stand above it and shoot downwards. That, that kind of sometimes produces an okay kind of picture, but it's a bit lazy. You really need to try to get right down to that plant to really capture the, the, the true beauty of that flower and see it from the sort of plant's eye view, you might say, down on the ground. It does mean you've got to have a good functioning set of knees, it's true, but it's, but it's much the best way to, to photograph these plants. So this, this flower grow, only grows maybe 20, no, probably less than 20 centimetres, 15 centimetres tall, so uh, six inches tall at most. Um, if you think of it as a primrose, it's a kind of member of the primrose family. So, so it's a primrose on a, on a stalk, so it's growing up to about 10 to 15, actually more like 10, 10 to 15 centimetres tall. So you've got to get right down alongside it, go to photograph it in this way. Again, soft, flat lighting, no, no bright sunlight on it, just makes it easier to actually get a, a good overall exposure. And then it's, um, the lens aperture is f13, so depth, normally the depth of field at f13 would be quite big, but because I've come in really close using a macro lens, even at f13, everything behind the flower goes, blurs out. Got a few flowers in the background still showing, which helps in, in some way to, to, to get, set the context. Uh, but everything else, all the green vegetation is completely blurred out. So that ensuring that the uh, that the cowslip really stands out from the background, it just really sort of grabs your attention. Nothing else competes for, for its attention. I use F13 not um, really to try and get the whole bunch of flowers on this stalk sharp, and I've pretty well managed that. The flowers over on this side, on the back side of the, of the, of the group have gone rather blurred, but everything else is certainly the flowers that are on the side facing me are all completely sharp, That's which is which is great. And But the background is still blurred, which is really what I needed. All right, so something rather different, still flowers, but taken with a wide angle lens, it's taken with a 20, you know, lens set at 21 millimeters. So it's really quite a wide view. Um, usually if you're trying to photo photograph plants or flowers, small flowers, small wildflowers, especially with a wide angle lens, it doesn't really work at all because you can't, just can't get close enough. But if you've got the, um, if you've got lucky enough to have a, a wide angle lens that has a very short minimum focusing distance, then you can do this kind of thing. And, and that's what I have. This, this is a Canon 17 to 40 millimeter lens that enables me to come in to about 30 millimeters from the subject. So it's really quite, so quite remarkable. And end up with these sort of uh, wide angle close up shots, which obviously show not just the plant, but the environment is growing as well. So, this plant is a kidney vetch, which is not entirely coastal, but it's, you, you see it mostly on the coast and generally growing in the most rugged, harshest conditions. So, really growing on, uh, in a place where there's pretty much no soil, just almost straight out of the rock and just growing in this really wild, harsh environment. This is at Boss Castle on the North coast of Cornwall, so really exposed to Atlantic winds, Atlantic weather, but able to uh, thrive nevertheless with these stunning yellow flowers. Obviously photographed, as you can see, in strong uh, sunlight. Might have been better to photograph it in, 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 in flat light. I probably should go back there in a few weeks' time when they come out again and redo the shots in, on, on a cloudy day and see if uh, see, see how, what, uh, how it's different, see, see how it compares. So yeah, so coming in close. And again, coming you know, lying down on the ground next to the plants, using a wide angle lens so to, to sort of 
exaggerate some of my diagonals and show not only the plant but also the environment that it's in. And this was shot while we were looking at it, F, F upon 18, so really maximizing the depth of field. The background is still quite good because even though it's a wide angle lens, the depth of field is limited because I've come in so close to, to the subject. But basically the flowers themselves are sharp, except perhaps these few in the, on, on the far side of the plant, which is fine by me, but all these flowers on the side that is facing, that are facing me are, are absolutely fine. Nice sort of uh, a nice coastal marine maritime shot. And then I suppose no, no talk about spring spring photography. Well, that's that last shot, the, the kidney vetch was photographed in May. So they're, they're, they're kind of, um, could be found on the coasts anywhere between sort of mid-April and early June, early to mid-June. So you've got a bit of a window of opportunity there with the kidney vetch. Anyway, so no, photogra no photography of spring photo flowers would be complete without them. primroses growing just about everywhere, really, on grasses and gardens and so on. Um, Obviously, very often you might have garden varieties if you're photographing in the garden, but the, the wild varieties, the wild variety, I should say, grows in gardens quite quite energetically as well. Um, always struggled to get good composition with, with primroses. They never seem to grow in quite the right kind of cluster. This is one of my better efforts. Um, and I, personally, I would have preferred to have a, a primrose in this little gap here as well, but this was a sort of reasonably nice tight cluster of primroses that work quite well and with the flowers also more or less in the same plane so, so meaning that they're all more or less the same distance from the lens as each other so enabling me to if I get the camera at the camera's axis at uh, completely 90 degrees to the flowers then all these flowers are pretty much the same distance and so I can get them all in focus without too much difficulty. Shot it at f upon 11 uh, it's a hundredth of a second so I would have handheld the camera here for this f.11 with a with a 24 to 105 millimeter lens coming as, as close as I can with that lens but not shooting macro uh, if I want but if I was um, shooting macro I would have been able to come in on a single um, flower which I didn't really want to do I actually wanted to just to actually show just a group of flowers sometimes a group of flowers especially when it's a tight group like this works better than a single flower it's nice to actually have the group sometimes lighting you see it is <clears throat> excuse me it is sunny uh, but not bright bright sunlight again as with the um, wood anemones the white wood anemones earlier uh, burning out in bright sunlight primroses also burn out they're obviously not not white they're pale yellow but they're, they're pale enough to actually really reflect the sunlight very strongly so if you've got really strong sunlight then they will burn out very easily and, have, and generate also a very uh, dark background as well so it's it's better to photograph them in soft light. This, this is in sunlight, but it's fairly mild, soft sunlight, if you, if you like. And with the sunlight coming down, yeah, it's coming down almost straight onto the flowers. Um, so there is a danger of light bouncing back from the flowers in, into the camera and causing some burnout. But there are a few bright areas, but none of it has burned out. It's all reasonably un well under control and given us quite an attractive, what I think is quite an attractive picture of, of primroses. And then I'm going to show you a couple of shots which emphasize the need to have a few a few things that perhaps a little a little more unusual and I'm just uh, starting here with apple blossom obviously everyone talks about cherry blossoms in, in April well I, I decided to go and get, go with uh, with apple blossom this is actually in my garden in May early May I think and again photographed as, uh, in completely flat light in fact as you can see in rather rainy weather don't have to worry about too much about rain that having water on the petals really makes it look adds an extra dimension you might say to the flowers it gives another layer of it, another area another layer of interest which i find quite attractive um again very pale petals so you, again you really have to be careful not to have them burn out in bright sunlight uh, which is the reason why i photograph these in, in, in completely flat cloudy light to really make sure that they i can capture them all and uh uh, not have any, any problems with highlights and shadows. So this was taken uh, f13 uh, with uh, so uh, getting um, a reasonable depth of field. Obviously the flowers towards the background are starting to, to, to fade out, but the, the petals that are most important to me and the stamen in, in the middle are all completely sharp. So that's the most important part of the picture. And this one leaf here is mostly pretty sharp as well. So that's got, uh, I always find this a quite a, a very atmospheric sort of springtime shot, which uh, 
uh, it's something that's really worth uh, uh, aiming at, whether you choose cherry blossoms or the plum blossoms that are out at the moment, or as I say, with this apple blossoms. And then a couple of shots which shows, show a few things that really keep your eyes open for flowers and plants generally that aren't getting any limelight. I've already talked about the, uh, the wood anemones, but there are lots of other plants that are really good, worthwhile keeping your eye on or keeping your eye out for in spring. This is a yellow dead nettle. It's called a dead nettle because it doesn't sting you. There is, there's only the one variety, as far as I'm aware, and the one species of nettle that stings you, and they have sort of rather inconspicuous green flowers. But if you see a nettle plant that looks exactly like a nettle but has brightly colored flowers, or be this yellow one, or um, one of the other colors, uh, sort of a mauvey color, I believe, uh, then they, they're not stingers. And, and they, uh, so they're called dead nettles. So yellow dead nettle, great uh, flower. I mean, it's just really, really beautiful. Nobody really pays them any attention. You see them in all sorts of uh, places in the countryside. Photographed in sunshine, um, that's really, I think it probably sunshine with uh, sun coming in from the top left here. We do have a highlight here, which is starting to burn out. Probably would have been better to photograph it in, in flat, um, soft lighting, but uh, this works reasonably well. I'm quite happy with it. Uh, probably should have gone back when, when the sun went behind a cloud to actually photograph it in soft lighting, but it looks pretty good like this, I think. And uh, just really captures a, a flower, which is not many people really pay much attention, if any attention at all. And I, and I think that's a shame because you can see it really is quite an attractive flower. And another one which um, people pay much more attention to orchids, but usually orchids that are from Thailand or, or uh, the Philippines or somewhere tropical anyway, people don't really pay too much attention to that, uh, Britain's own orchids, of which there are actually quite a few. Uh, this, I think, is the early purple orchid, it's certainly purple, and it was also early as well, so I think it's probably the early purple orchid. Again, like the cowslips grows, as far as I know, on uh, on limestone gra grassland, and it's called the early purple, not only because it's purple, but it, it does grow, come into flower much earlier than most of the orchids in Britain. Most orchids in, in the UK flower in sort of June, perhaps a little bit in July. Uh, but this one is photographed in May. I think they start flowering in April. So, you, so it's one of the first orchids to come into flower, one of the first ones that you, you see. And I've chosen in this shot to photograph the whole of the uh, flower cluster that's growing up on one stem. Uh, photographed in soft, flat light. It, the or with photographing an orchid like this with such the flowers, individual flowers have such a complex shape. And then if you photograph the whole cluster, it becomes even more cluster and more uh, complicated, more complex. In bright sunlight, it all just dis disintegrates into chaos and it really becomes a bit of a mess. So much better to photograph these in, in really soft, flat light. Can also, of course, come in close to photograph individual flowers. I do have a couple of shots take, uh, which concentrate just on this one flower at the top here. And that works quite nicely, but of course, it doesn't really tell you much about the whole the whole plant and that, the way the, the flowers grow in, in, in groups like this, in clusters like this on the, on the vertical stem. So I wanted to show you this whole vertical stem covered in, in flowers. And obviously the flowers at the top are the newest and the flowers at the bottom are the oldest. So you can see it's all, all the flowers starting to go off as you go, go lower down the, the, the cluster of flowers. Well, really a nice flower to keep, keep your, an eye out for. And also for all the other orchids as well. Uh, uh, southern marsh orchid and um, heath orchids and so on, which are all really attractive. And the, per, uh, the pyramidal orchid, which grows a lot in sandy soil, as well as actually in chalk as well. And then a few other shots that will just give you a couple of simple ideas. It's a very simple idea for, for plant photography, just coming in really close on, on a really fresh new beech leaf. Uh, this is taken in May, very soon after it is actually uh, leafed out. And it, when the flat and the leaf is still very soft and and translucent, so uh, the light is coming through the leaf. So the leaf, this leaf is backlit, so I'm getting the light coming through, and it's really showing up all the veins beautifully and the hairs along the edge of the of the, of the leaf. So this is shot with a macro lens coming in pretty close on this single beech leaf. I do have shots showing clusters of leaves as well, but I really quite like this this um, shot of this single leaf. I think this is. Uh, one that I prefer. It's very simple and, and uh, straightforward, and, and uh, there's no sort of doubting what it's about. It's shot, shot against blue sky. So this is actually a, a hedge in my garden. I've just come out, come sort of got behind the little branch that's growing out from the from the bush, and just 
got behind the leaf, this leaf and photograph of the, uh, the leaf with the, with, against the blue sky. So we're getting low and, and photographing upwards. And then, of course, like the primrose, no talk of uh, spring photography would be complete without bluebells. And all sorts of ways to photograph bluebells. Obviously, one of those start with photo photography of the of a general woodland scene with bluebells carpeting the floor. Um, this is, I think I've shown people this one a few times before, but this is a shot taken in a nice, fairly open woodland glade. It's actually a, an old, it remains of an old Roman camp. So that which the woodland still hasn't completely grown across. So it's an open grassy area among the well-spread trees, perfect place really for these bluebells to grow. Um, a lot of people have told me they really struggle with bluebells, and I completely understand. If you use a wide-angle lens to capture the, the whole scene, which is a very tempting thing to do, you end up with the bluebells looking very, very small and rather distant, and often really rather spread out as well, and not looking like a, such a grand, as grand a concentration of, of flowers as, as you actually saw. So with this shot, I've used a fairly standard lens. It's not a wide angle. Not a, it's a slightly wide, I think it's about 35 millimeter lens, so a little bit of a wide angle view, but looking at an area where the flowers are particularly um, particularly dense uh, and just really showing the, a view of the whole scene. Uh, now, uh, lighting, obviously, it is quite strongly sunlit. We've got a couple of areas that are starting to burn out a little bit, but the overall atmosphere, I think, is, is beautiful. Usually when I'm shooting in a woodland, I prefer to shoot it in soft, flat light when it's overcast. But I do find if I'm shooting really early in the morning, when the sun is still quite low, uh, then if I'm shooting into the lights, then the sunlight can really work really beautifully and be quite magical. So you can see the sun at the top of the picture. It's not fantastically low, but it's, it's, it's about um, at seven o'clock in the morning, I suppose. So the sun is, is, is heading upwards and it's really shining through the trees. We've got all these these leaves beautifully backlit and it's sending out shadows of the trees across the bluebells, which I think is really setting up quite a nice atmosphere. But really, if the sun were any higher, uh, I would, or if the sun were behind me, I would generally would prefer to, uh, to shoot with it, with, the, with it being cloudy, with soft, flat lighting, and that work, it works very, very well too. So if you want to then do something that's much closer up, then you, I would come in and do a shot like this. So it's not the same woodland. This is actually a different woodland this is, uh, near where I live. Just really use come in again, come in very low, come in sort of the flowers, get the flowers eye view, the flowers height right down on the ground, and shoot along and across the the, the the plants. Not necessarily aiming to get a huge depth of field because that's quite a tricky thing to do, and just really get the middle part of the picture sharp. And you see, we've got some some of the flowers are pretty sharp, but then in the background, it's really completely blurred out. Foreground is a little bit blurred. And then just looking around the clusters of the trees. Obviously, the, the problem with, with doing this is you don't get much of a view of the of the woodland. You don't get to see the environment, but you do get to home in on the bluebells quite nicely, which gives us a nice cluster and really really crowds. If you use a telephoto lens, it really compresses the distance and really crowds the bluebells together nicely and gives you a nice um, sense of just how crowded the bluebells are. Okay, so then moving on, do a little, few landscapes, moving away from close-ups of the plants and into the landscapes. Dartmoor, well, any moorland really is, is, is taken on Dartmoor, but it's going to apply to all sorts of open countryside in May. Um, taken in late in the evening, really want to shoot when the sun is quite low. Obviously in May, middle of the day, the sun is getting pretty high. So it's generally not recommended for landscape photography, especially. Not really recommended for, for plant photography either to have shoot in the middle of the day when the sun is really high. Best to photograph early, early, early and late, and that's what I've done here is shooting uh, in, in the evening shortly before sunset. I'm really homing in on this one rock here. The rock here is photographically the subject. That's what your eye homes in on and latches in on. But then really the idea is to show the landscape in the background and how the whole landscape is turning green and the bracken is starting to come up hasn't completely taken over yet, so the ground is still open for me to shoot these rocks, and uh, but really shows the bracken starting to, to grow through. Nice so, bit of sunlight, there's very strong sunlight actually coming in from the left. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Sun coming in from the left. A little bit of danger of burnout on the left here with a bit, bit too much light, but 
overall, the light on, on in the picture is really quite quite nice. Nice bit of evening sunlight. And then if you move on fully into May, this again is on Dartmoor, so this is right at the end of May because the, the, the trees on Dartmoor tend to leaf out rather later. Uh, really, if you do a photograph the woodlands in, in May, shortly after they've leafed out and into June as well, the, their greens are just so vibrant. It's just such a rich, vibrant green you see. And set against this river, because the river's a bit brown actually, because it was taken shortly after some heavy rain. So it's, it's really, the river's flowing really hard. We've got these, these twin or trio of rocks, I suppose, in the foreground to actually take the eye into the into the frame and then lead you into the into the woodland in the, in the background and really set up the scene for this fabulously verdant woodland. Uh, it, it, sort of freshly leafed out and really strong, strong greens. Much better than photographing a woodland, say in September or October, when the leaves are starting to get quite dull and not and really losing their their, uh, their beautiful green shine. Once you go on far enough, you end up in late October into, into November when uh, the leaves all become nice and golden, hopefully, and give you some wonderful autumn colors. But at the start of summer, really vibrant greens. Uh, finally, we move on into some animals. A bit of animal photography in spring. Obviously, this is, this is a goldfinch. Obviously, a goldfinch is a goldfinch at any time of year. But what it's perching on is uh, what really tells you about the time of year. And here it's perching on some blackthorn uh, out, out in the countryside. So this is one of the sort of the earliest um, countryside hedges, bushes that you see going into flower at about this time, March, April, um, even February actually in, in some places. So. Uh, flowering pretty early in the, in the year and just having this um, goldfinch sitting on there really sets it off and, really and the, having the, the blackthorn there really tells us what time of year it is and sets the, sets the season for us. Sunlight, of course, well, yeah, photographing birds, I usually photograph birds in sunlight because they often don't really work that well in dull flat light, unlike flowers. Um, despite the fact, obviously you've got sort of shadows and highlights on, on, a, on a bird that's lit up would be sunlight, but uh, th th their colours don't show up terribly well or as well in, in, in soft flat lighting. And also because they move around so much, you often have to use quite a fast shutter speed, which if you've got dull lighting can be a bit of an issue. Similar kind of thing with a robin, but this time on, on hawthorn, photographed in May, uh, the hawthorn flowers all the way through May. And you end up with these, with these fabulous bushes just, just loaded up with these white flowers. And we have this, uh, I just happened to catch this robin on the tree. I mean, obviously, uh, robins are kind of just about everywhere, really, and it's ten a penny, so I get a bit sort of sick of uh, robins posing for me on trees. But I thought this one was actually really worth uh, really worth doing because of the, the, just because of the tree it's on and the fabulous flowers that's uh, it, 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 blooming all around him. So rather an unusual shot of a robin. Backlit, the light is coming in from behind the robin and from behind the foot plants as well. So the little the light is a little bit tricky on the robin, but nevertheless, he's, it means that actually his breast and everything is actually fairly evenly lit. So we don't have the problem of bright highlights and deep shadows on his body. He's quite evenly lit all over. And by overexposing the picture a little bit, then we actually managed to make sure he's not actually in deep shadow. A little bit of bright highlight on the flowers, but that also helps a little bit with the atmosphere, really with the sort of sunlit spring-like at atmosphere and then more in spring of course so it, it, always a, a well-worn and popular theme um, photographing chicks of swans or ducks or whatever um, you see quite a few pictures of uh, along this theme I, I find it not an easy thing to do you've got to catch just the right moment uh, at the, sort of in the right week of the year when the chicks are doing the right sort of things it's, it's uh, not, not such an easy thing to catch. It didn't just uh, happen. Fortunately, this is a reasonably good composition that came together for me at the uh, Abbotsbury Swannery in Dorset. They have quite a nice cl cluster of, uh, of swan chicks and, and one of the parents around them. So this is, uh, I quite like this shot. Nicely sunlit as well. So it's not, uh, obviously swans, beautiful white plumage, but in bright sunlight can be a problem with, with, the, with it all burning out. But here the sunlight is relatively low not too strong so it's under control all that white is, is you can see it hasn't burned out you can still see all the detail in the feathers and then one super cute picture uh, just really the first chick of spring taken in march last year i think it was uh, a black swan obviously black swans are not native to britain they're an australasian 
bird, so you see them down under. Uh, but in a few places, this one photographed in Dawlish on the south coast of Devon, they have a couple of um, black swans that sort of live around the town. They think they're wild in the sense they are wild, but they just happily live around the town and um, quite um, at ease, well, as with all with white swans too, at ease with having people close by. So you can easily get pictures of, of the black swans on their nest and with their chicks. Uh, in terms of photographing other birds on, on the nest, you have to bear in mind there are laws regarding it. Uh, some It is illegal to photograph some birds on the, on the nest uh, because it is illegal to disturb them, not so much the photography per se, but actually disturbing them. So you have to uh, take care. It's, it's worthwhile checking out the, I think it's the Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1988. There's an appendix which lists all the bird species that you're not allowed to photograph when they're nesting, or not allowed to disturb, I should say, when they're nesting. Uh, it's quite surprising what is and what, what isn't on that uh, on that list. Some quite rare birds are not on the list, and some relatively common birds do seem to be on the list. So it's a little bit odd. But anyway, uh, in terms of photography, this is again seizing the right moment, really, just when you've got this very sort of uh, nurturing, caring moments here with the with the parents' uh, head and bill down alongside the chick's face, and that, this is what appealed to me. Taken, of course, with a telephoto lens, it's a 300 millimeter lens. Uh, you don't, you're not going to get too close. I mean, this is since the, the bird's nest is on an island in the middle of the river anyway, so you can't get too close. Definitely don't want to disturb the bird, that's for sure. I'm photographed in soft flat lighting as well, so no harsh highlights and deep shadows. Um, and then all the feathers are beautifully exposed, not a problem with, with the lighting with that. And then the next shots. Obviously, migratory birds, those birds that uh, we don't see for most of, much of the year, but show up in spring, which we need to put, which uh, attract some attention. And the most famous of those is probably the cuckoo. Uh, quite a challenge to photograph, I found, uh, but they're and quite a challenge to find them in the first place because they're, they're not half as common as they used to be. It's quite difficult to know where they are sometimes. But once again, Dartmoor for me com comes to the rescue. There's quite a few up on Dartmoor. It's still a stronghold of. Uh, King of uh, cuckoos, I should say. And um, so once you know the sites where the cuckoos uh, um, like to be on, on Dartmoor, then you can uh, go, up, go up to those places and find, slowly work out what trees they like to sit in and what their pattern of movement is. It takes a while. It's, it's classically with a lot of wildlife photography, it's working out what the, what the animals preferred, how habitual movements are around their environments and that, that's not such an easy thing to do and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but on this particular day I got quite lucky and got quite a few pictures of a couple of cuckoos perching in a few trees uh, on this uh, nature reserve site in, in the heart of Dartmoor. So um, yeah that's one problem solved obviously it's, it's taken from quite some distance away this is taken with a 400 millimeter lens with a two times converter attached so a total of 800 millimeter uh, of uh, distance so I'm looking in from a couple of hundred yards away and then obviously the background is completely blurred out so no danger of any interference here this, this these are bits of hawthorn on the right here a little bit distracting perhaps but uh, I'm prepared to live with that and lucky to get any kind of shot of a cuckoo let alone one that's absolutely technically perfect so I thought I'd just quite happily leave leave those there and, and li live with that that slight distraction but really, the cuckoos are very much a, a shot of a bird of spring and, and something that a lot of people aim for. Um, they arrive April, May, and right there through to June, and not around very long. Actually, I think they're around a little bit longer than we realised, because I think they, they, once they've done their breeding, they, they fall silent. So we hear them calling in, in late April and through, throughout May. But I think in June, I think they're still around, but they're not calling. So they're much harder to find in, in, once you get past the, uh, the spring months and into summer. And then marine birds, not really so much migratory because they're around our coasts um, for much of the year, but out at sea, so we don't get to see them. And they come onto the coast in the spring months to breed for a couple of months. Um, most arrive sort of in mid or late May, like the puffins and the guillemots and so on, arrive in late May. The gannets, which is what we was looking at here, they arrive rather earlier. They arrive about now in, in March, as far as I understand it anyway. And so you can see that from now onwards through till well, through till October, actually, they stay quite a long time on their nesting sites. Um, unfortunately, for photography around the UK, they nest almost entirely on on off islands, rather 
quite often rather remote off islands as well. But there is one site in England uh, where they nest on the mainland, uh, and that is uh, Bempton Cliffs in Yorkshire, which is where this was taken. So if you want to have easy access to photographing gannets, Bempton Cliffs in Yorkshire is really the, the place to go to. This is photographed with 400 millimeter lens. Um, no need for converter here. Of course, gannets are pretty big birds, so you don't need to get too close to them. And um, you can end up with some quite uh, atmospheric and dramatic shots. Obviously, this is um, no, no chicks here. You have to really wait until July to see chicks on the nesting ledges, sites and ledges. So these, these brown patches, these are the individual nests. This is actually exactly where they, where they nest on these chalk cliffs. Um, don't build much, much by way of an actual nest as such. But you don't see any chicks really until about July or thereabouts. But from about now, now onwards, you'll see these the gannets on the on the cliffs. And then what else have we got? Oh, then mammals. Yeah, got a few mammals included in, in the in as well. A lot of mammals. We talk about mammals hibernating and so on, which of course some do. Some genuinely hibernate. Others just become less active and less visible during the winter. And others just keep going all winter long. And um, this shot shows a beaver, a beaver actually on the River Otter in Devon. Um, there are otters on the River Otter as well, but it's beavers are, are seem to be easier to photograph. They're not quite so shy as otters are. And uh, they, I think they are less active in winter. They, they spend more time in their dens in the winter, but in the spring, they come out and they start to be a lot more active, a lot more visible. And you can find them, let's say, on a couple of rivers in, in Devon now and a few other places. They've started to be reintroduced around a few places around the UK. But the River Otter is, was, was the first place in Devon where they were reintroduced. And um, they seem to be quite used to having people around them. So once you find the sites where they have their dens, um, then you can really um, get to see them. They, they are what's called crepuscular, which means they come out only at dusk and dawn. So it, they are quite difficult to, to photograph because they usually appear when, just when the light levels are really getting horribly low. So this was taken um, with a camera on a tripod, 125th of a second, F, uh, F5, but with an ISO of 1250. So this is a really uh, example of a situation where it's better to have a grainy picture than no picture at all. So uh, this shot is rather grainy, which is what you'd expect with that shot taken with a very high ISO, but thanks to good software and post photography processing, it's not come out too badly. It's uh, perfectly, it certainly shows you know, beavers uh, out on the river. And then something about what not to do really, don't bother photographing deer in spring, I would say, because they just they can look really pretty manky, as you can see with these red deer on Exmoor. Uh, in, it's taken in April, so uh, the winters can be pretty hard on them and they don't really look at their best at all. So they, they look pretty rough. So if you want deer, if you want to photograph deer in a really fine fettle, looking great, wait till the autumn and the, and the rutting, when the rutting season comes around when they look just look fantastic. At this, at this time of year, they're starting to look a bit rough. And also actually, about now, the deer tend to lose, the, the males obviously lose their antlers. So uh, not looking quite so spectacular. It's not, not such a great time. So yeah. <laughs> Photographed, um, however, in terms of technical, with a 400 millimeter lens, so difficult to get close to. Often have to surprise them really rather than actually um, creep up on and, and surprise them a little bit rather than actually uh, they don't really allow you to get particularly close. That's for sure. And then finally, just a little nod towards insects. Insects start coming out from about uh, now onwards. Obviously, already quite a few gnats and mosquitoes in my garden, but uh, the, the type of insect that we like to photograph, you know, butterflies and damselflies and so on. Come out, come out from March onwards, we get with a few of the smaller butterflies. Peacocks, which is what this is, comes out, one of, the large, one of our larger butterflies come out in April or so, which is, I think this is photographed in April, possibly May. And um, so, yeah, so, so they'll be sort of coming onto our radar pretty soon. This photograph, of course, with a macro lens coming in pretty close, so the Depth of field is very small, just a few centimeters, if that, maybe only, even, only a centimeter, maybe less. And photographed on quite a bright day, but photographed in shadow. So we've got nice, soft, flat, even lighting across the whole butterfly. And with the axis of the camera lens completely at 90 degrees to the, to the uh, butterfly's wings. So it's sharp. So the wings all, all, all the way from far left to far right 
are pretty much the same distance from the lens. So they're able to get the whole thing sharp, sharply in focus all the way across. Okay, so that's um, wildlife dealt with. Going to move on to a little bit about landscapes now. Obviously, if you're photographing things like sunset, sunrise, the position of the sun rising and setting sun, this is taken at sunset across the, uh, the River X at Exmouth. Obviously, the position of the, of the setting sun and the rising sun changes very rapidly at this time of year. Uh, equinox is, is about now, so the sun is now setting and rising almost exactly in the east, but it's moving north all the time. If I were to come back to this view, maybe two, a week or two, or two weeks after this shot was taken, it, the setting sun will be way off to the right, probably outside this particular view. So sometimes you need to choose your the moment when you want to, want to shoot this kind of view, uh, not just by the weather, but by also where you think the sun is going to be and whether it's going to be in the best position for you. Another thing, another thing to look at from, in this view from the point of view of the human world, you see all these mooring boys scattered over the river and they're almost all of them, great majority of them are empty. And um, it's taken in March, so most of the boats are still out of the water at this time. Really from early April onwards, boats start to appear, be, be, be put in the water and come onto their moorings. So by May, this, um, this area of moorings will be absolutely crowded with boats. So it'll be a very different picture in a few weeks time or so, certainly once you get to May, it'll be quite crowded with boats, which if you're doing a travel stroke tourism kind of photo, you might think is absolutely fantastic. So it's nice and lively and colorful and, uh, and really shows the, sort of the travel and tourism scene in Devon. Um, but uh, from a landscape perspective, it might look rather untidy and, and cluttered. So uh, with, with it as it is, the um, mooring boys might be a little bit distracting, but on the other hand, it also makes the river look a lot more open and, and empty and actually might work, works better perhaps as a landscape photograph, but less so as a travel tourism photograph. And then another shot taken uh, not far from my home in, in Devon at the mouth of the River Teen. Uh, basically, this shot is really about, not really about the River Teen, so it's about surfaces that face north. So in this case, this cliff over on the over in the background here. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back again. This cliff over on it faces almost due north. So uh, it's difficult really to but get sunlight shining on it through the winter months or indeed much of the autumn and spring. You really have to wait till you get past the equinox and then the sun starts shining uh, in, in the northern half of the sky early and late in the day and will then shine on, on, on that face of that cliff. So it's important to sort of for natural features, also important for buildings as well. So, for example, if you're trying to photograph churches and, and cathedrals, most of them in the UK run east-west with the altar eastern end and the uh, main entrance at the western end. So it means you've got the great big northern wall, uh, which is in shadow for much of the year. You've got the southern wall you can photograph if it's easily accessible. But if you want to photograph the northern side for any reason, uh, you, it, it's, it's going to be in shadow most of the year and you want to wait until uh, the, the late spring or the spring months after the equinox and uh, through the summer to be able to photograph it early and early and late in the day when the sun swims around uh, into the northern sky just be, just after sunset sun sorry, just after sunrise and just before sunset so bear that in that kind of thing in mind when you're photographing uh, <clears throat> buildings or landscape features that face north you may want to you know, consider photographing those uh, early and late in the day from about now onwards. And then the shot that I accidentally showed you just now, uh, again, the same kind of idea, really. The sun has just set there, and you see it's looking directly along the river. This is, is uh, again, the River Team, photographed uh, at sunset in March, so really right on the equinox when the sun is setting and rising, or is rising in the east and setting in, in the west, exactly. Uh, so if I photograph this view, in the middle of March, late March, I can look directly along the river, which runs exactly east-west, and I know the sun will set right in the middle of the scene. In midwinter, the sun sets way over here, and set, and in the middle of summer, it sets way over here, if not further. Sorry, let's keep clicking on my mouse button. Um, so, I want to have the sun setting in the middle of the river, this east-west running river. I want to look directly west and so photograph it in mid to late March when the sun sets right over the middle of the river. Otherwise, I've got it over here on the, on the right in, mid, in midsummer, or here way over on the left 
uh, in midwinter. So always think of your timing, the time of year and what it is you're trying to achieve with your landscape views. And then moving on into the human activity of, in spring, obviously think people start to have a much more outdoor life, thank goodness, uh, as, as spring kicks in and you end up uh, having a lot more uh, human stuff to photograph in terms of sports and, and, uh, and, and just people being out and about much more. So it's something that can be uh, enjoyed and, and photographed a, a lot more easily uh, from about now onwards. So again, this is a, um, again on the on, on the River X uh, at the top of near Exeter, taken just before sunset. Just a, a really nice little shot of uh, uh, people sailing up up the river. Technically, I was uh, I got the setting sun really way too close to the edge of the picture. Perhaps I should have waited for the boat to sail a little bit further forward, so I could so I could have the sun more into the picture and closer to the boat. I suspect I've got this shot because perhaps just off to the right of the picture there may be something really. A little bit yucky, very distracting, like a um, big cluster of, of boats or something, or, or maybe I wanted to try and include this house that's on the far left in, in the shot. I'm not sure what, what was going on there. It's, it was taken a while ago, this shot, so I'm not sure why I ended up with this composition. But it's nevertheless, although the sun is right on the edge of the picture, which is a little bit frustrating for me, nevertheless, it's a really atmospheric shot, which really sort of shows a, a nice bit of human activity, you might say. And then festivals. I mean, festivals start springing up at this time of year. Um, Cornwall is a good place for springtime festivals. And this shows the, the Helston Floral Dance uh, held on the 8th of May every year, not surprisingly, in, in Helston in the west of Cornwall. Um, never an easy thing to shoot some of these festivals because you, you can't get, don't want to get too close into the action. But again, you don't, but then again, you don't want to have too much space around the action either. Otherwise, you end up with way too much tarmac, which is never very attractive. I've just about got away with it here, not with not too much visible, a little bit, a little bit visible, but not too bad. And then also trouble with, with festivals that take place on the streets. You have all these signs, all this signage, which is distracting, not terribly attractive. But you know, it's it's not too much in your there in, in this shot. Your attention really is drawn to these people in the middle of the of the street dancing. This is what the, the uh, Helston floral dance is. The people of, of Helston dress up and dance through the streets of, of Helston, which is really quite um, Quite, quite fun to watch. You can see, of course, it was absolutely a terrible day. It had been pouring down with rain until just a few minutes before this shot was taken. Everybody on the sidelines looked really quite soggy, which brings the picture down a little bit. But it's lifted by this fantastic red dress, which really puts a spark back into the picture. And then you, because they're, they're sharply in focus, and also, of course, in the foreground, your attention falls on them with the red dress as well. And then uh, hopefully is led along the line of dancers. And hopefully you don't pay too much attention to the rather soggy, wet people standing along the pavement. If that doesn't really quite work for you, then you try something else and you home in on the details of the events, just picking out a few people here and there, just catching the details and just sort of little snippets, vignettes, cameos of what's going on. And that ensures that so you capture a little bit of detail, nice and sharp and everything else is blurred. So all the signage on the street is gone and it just is a nice sort of backdrop of of a town without all the modern advertising and modern signs to get in the way and, and distract. And then one more festival, the Obios Festival, which is held on the 1st of May every year in Padstow on the north coast of Cornwall. Great little, great, I say little festival, it's uh, it's pretty crowded. Um, one of the great things about Cornish festivals, I don't know about other, other parts of the world, but uh, or other parts of the UK, I should say, is that uh, there's you won't see a single crash barrier, not a crash barrier in sight, and, and not a single policeman either. They, they make a, a point of staying away, I think. So you can be fantastically crowded. And also from the photographer's point of view, you can get really stuck into the crowds and then stuck into the action, into the events. One of the big problems photographers often have at a lot of events is that crash barriers, stewards, guards, generally police, security guards, uh, try and keep photographers quite some distance away and, and help end up ruining the photography but fortunately these festivals in Cornwall there's, there's none of that you can just get stuck right in and become really part of the scene which is just a fantastic thing to, 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 to experience this one taken on a beautifully sunny day so it does mean we have uh, highlights and shadows across people's faces but um, looks looks great looks um, very alive 
and um, it's really celebratory, which is what I was trying to actually was trying to put over. And this is the final shot, just a close up of what is called the Obvious at the Obvious Festival in Paso. And this is kind of the sort of detail that I like to pick up in these events. So this is um, really just saying, look out for, for spring festivals and events that you can head to and really sort of get some shots of the human world as well as the natural world. So that really is um, kind of it. That's as far as I wanted to go. And I'll stop really just the final thing, just just obviously not the usual books, but also details of what else is coming up. The next talk is going to be on the 21st of June. And we're talking about the, how to use the wide angle lens for really effective photography, um, ju just um, sort of using it in somewhat different ways and ways that a lot of people uh, use it for. And then the spring workshops coming up in the next couple of months, 22nd of April, 29th of April, 13th of May, 20th of May, and the 22nd of July. So uh, that is, that's it really. So um, I'm gonna unshare my screen. And if anybody wants then to um, ask any questions, they can do so. If, if you uh, remember, if you do turn your camera on, then you will be visible in the recording that goes online later on. So it's up to you whether you have your camera on or not, but I think I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. There we go. So, um, if anybody would like to ask any questions, that would be great. Hi, Nigel, it's Laurie. Hi, Hi Laurie. Um, I had a colleague that I used to be with, with bits of photography and stuff. And one thing when he was doing flower photography, particularly mm -hmm. single blooms, yeah, he would carry around a, a, like a spray water bottle to do oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, that's... He, also, he also had a piece of blue card that was very similar mm -hmm. to the blue sky. Right. So he could isolate a single bloom if he wanted to, just propping it up or whatever Yeah, behind mm -hmm. the flower. Yeah, there, 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 are these, uh, there are these various tricks, that's for sure, which, um, which uh, um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I have done that sort of thing from time to time as well. But of course, there's more stuff to carry as well, which that's, that's one yeah. of the other problems. Mm -hmm. But so. Uh, yeah, and, and sometimes a blue sky against a, a, a single bloom is is not ideal, but it but it can be great as well. It obviously, it cuts mm -hmm. out any cluttered background. So, sort of a simple blue background might well be better than a rather cluttered load of vegetation. So, so it might well work. Yeah, I think with his water spray, I think he also had a small torch to create little speckle highlights on the right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Certainly. Yeah. Um. Okay, anybody else have a question? There was somebody put their hand up just now and I can't see who it was now. That's me and Guy. Hi, hi Nigel. Um, I've hi. got a question about that lovely picture of the lady in the blue dress at one of the celebrations. Oh, right. um, you, you know that we're quite new to photography because you've been helping us learn. So how, <laughs> yeah, did, you, how okay. did you manage to get kind of blurring at the front and focus on her and then blurring her behind her? Did you use the, the kind of screen to kind of focus in and, and pinpoint her face or were you able to oh, yeah, the, the so woman with her focus on her? Uh, her the woman with her arm up in the air yes um, yes yeah it's just taken with a telephoto lens actually let's have a look it's a 200 millimeter telephoto lens it's not particularly strong but with the lens aperture quite wide open so so a low f number so actually it's f6.3 so the lens aperture is quite wide so with a telephoto lens that means will mean a very narrow depth of field so not much of the picture is sharp so long as the lens is focused on her hand and, or, or, or her face, so she's, I think it's probably focused on her face actually, uh, then they'll be sharp and nothing else will be. So that's that's how you've managed to how I've managed to get that to work so that you, you, your attention did, homes in just on her. Did you use the kind of standard center um, autofocus, or did you did you kind of use the focus on your screen, or is there anything any magical wizardry for the focusing? Uh, no magical wizardry, really. There's no time to go. go, go make, this is the thing about this guy, especially festivals. There's no time to go fiddling around with with, with, you know, with, with little bits and pieces. You've got to just go in there and just uh, press the, press your shutter button to get the focus on, and then then shoot. So you don't have time to actually go doing anything extra. Okay, thank you. Well, you're welcome. Anybody else got any questions? Well, I'll go with another one if, if I can. Hi, Laurie. Yeah. yeah, it's really associated with depth of field. Yeah. Um, if you're doing close up of flowers and stuff, mm -hmm. are you better to use you know what you know, a sort of normal sort of fairly wide angle 
uh, low focal length lens? Or would you get anything more depth of field control by going to a telephoto lens and if necessary, putting a little uh, close up converter in there to get it a bit closer? Would you um, get a bit more leeway? Uh, for, uh, if you're doing just a single bloom, you're better off using a, a uh, a macro lens or a telephoto lens with an extension ring, uh, it's extension tube, sorry. Um, if you've got a, um, a close-up lens stroke ring on the front of the lens, the, the quality is not always that great. So it's best to use either a dedicated macro lens or a telephoto lens with an extension tube on it. An extension tube um, fits between the lens and the camera body and pushes the lens, lens further away from the camera body and that helps to shorten the minimum focusing distance so you can come in close enough to get uh, a good macro shot. It's a really good cheap way of um, starting in macro photography rather than going to the expense of having a, a really expensive macro lens. The wide angle lens idea is, is really comes up with uh, creates a very different kind of picture because it, it's a wide angle view so it shows the plants and its and its environment as well, so it, it doesn't show just the plant. So, it, so it, there's so there's pluses and minuses to both techniques. But um, the, the wide angle lens, you're not going to be able to come in that close to show an individual flower, unless it's a really big flower, of course, like a rose or something. But generally speaking, with wildflowers, you're usually dealing with quite small flowers. So um, you've got to um, use uh, if you use a wide angle lens, you're going to be show photographing much more than just that one flower. Plus, it's plus the environment. Oh, Does that make you. sense? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody what, got any more questions? If not, then uh, I would call the meeting to an end and um, say thank you so much for coming along and. Uh, if you have any other questions later on, just send me an email or, or me a text or something, and uh, I can try to answer. The talk will has been recorded and will go on to YouTube uh, next week sometime, so you'll be able to look watch it in your uh, uh, at your leisure. And um, so, hopefully, see you uh, on, at the next talk, and also, also perhaps at a workshop in the coming uh, couple of months. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for coming along tonight. Thanks. Bye.